Welcome to Tank Talk, where we discuss current events and all things relevant in this ever-changing water industry. Today with us, we have our guest, Rob White, who is a of Alabama Rural Water Association. Should be good. Here we go. All right, let's get this started. Jim and Anson here with Southern Corrosion, and we're here. Uh, we just we want to do the right thing for your water system, and that's part of the reason why we have Rob here with us today. I'm going to go over his bio real quick. I'm going to read this. I don't have it memorized, unfortunately. <laughs> Maybe I will one day. What do you mean you don't have it memorized? <laughs> Some of it's true. Well, uh, um, <laughs> But Rob here is the executive director for Alabama Rural Water, as everybody probably already knows. Um, he's been offering his invaluable expertise to the residents of Alabama and the water industry for nearly two decades. That's heavy. His expertise spans all facets of water and wastewater, utility management, and operations. As a certified specialist in both water and wastewater ops, as well as certified commercial emergency auditing and training specialist, Rob's credentials speak for themselves. As a facilitator, Rob has both planned and executed hundreds of hours of training seminars and conferences like this one for the benefit of water and wastewater professionals, both locally and nationally. He's been instrumental in implementing ARWA's emergency response program. I look forward to hearing more about that. Uh, presently holds a position on the National Water Emergency Response and Legislative Committees. He has four FEMA NIMS certifications um, Rob holds a deeply personal connection to Alabama, uh, born in Troy. Mm -hmm. He currently resides in a small town. It's an ideal uh, setting for his cherished family life. I always see your family around. I love that. That's how we are, <laughs> Southern Closure <Coalition> family. <clears throat> your family, your wife, Jessica, uh, and your three vibrant children, 14-year-old uh, Abigail, 12-year-old Robert White V. Yeah, is that he's right? the, the okay. fifth, yeah. And their youngest, George Maverick White, uh, who is just 18 months old. Both professionally and personally, Rob's life is a testament to his dedication and success. I need somebody to write something like that. <laughs> well, I'm wondering who wrote that. That's, uh... <laughs> so pulling away from the professional aspect of, of uh, who you are, won't you tell us in your own words who you are as, as a person, as a director for Alabama Rural Water and what you guys provide? Yeah, sure. No, and look, I, I appreciate the the kind words. It's, it's too much, really. At, at the core, I'm just a water and wastewater operator. It um, started out in the in the industry along those lines. There was actually was home from uh, college one summer looking for something to do, and there was an opening with the utility. You know, jumped in, fell in love with it, uh, progressed through there. Got received my training from Alabama Rural Water met my rural water circuit riders, and after a number of years, um, there was an opening as a circuit rider. So I called uh, Executive Director Kathy Horn at the time and basically just had a little short phone interview and said, hey, I don't even know if I'm qualified to apply, but I'd be interested. Um, and she said apply, and it worked out. And so I started circuit riding, which I truly love because I, I'm – I really, I love my community and the, the system that I was working with and learned a lot there. But another aspect was going to these trainings, meeting uh, my peers, working with my neighboring systems and, and trying to figure out, because we all have somewhat the same issues, you know, no water systems are exactly identical, but a lot of the right. uh, issues kind of ties together. And so I'd spend a lot of time with my neighbors sharing ideas. And so it was just kind of a natural step for me getting into the circuit rider role. I worked the southern third of the state and I had 187 systems in that territory and I would go system to system. And that really was my goal was just sharing successes. I wanted to analyze and learn, yep. uh, take my experience and pay it forward because every solution costs some amount of money. So if you've invested $5,000 and figured out the answer, I can take that answer mm -hmm. to, uh, to you and you can implement it and then hopefully you, you know, just share and, yeah. and kind of work together along those lines. <clears throat> so I did that for a number of years and um, 
I, you know, kind of tongue in cheek, I've always said I've just been too dumb to say no. So anytime <laughs> something would come up and, uh, you know, can you go help train? So you really I'll stumbled try. into this like everybody else does. It yeah. wasn't mm -hmm. planned. You didn't orchestrate no, this. I, I wasn't, you know, as a child, I wasn't taking apart meters and, you know, <laughs> looking at, uh, you know, bond documents or anything. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it, it's pretty wild. And that's, that's one of the things that we try to address, too, is um, I, I was at an event one time, and this was dealing with wastewater, and they, were st they said that the challenge was making wastewater sexy, which I still don't know if we solved that, but <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, promoting the industry yeah. and letting pe be, have, have people be more aware of the opportunity yeah. that's in front of them. And you can stay local or you can travel you know, I'm a um, small system water operator from southeast Alabama, and I've had opportunities to take trips to conferences across the country with our connection with National Rural Water and learn from all of these people. So it's the sky's the limit, and there's just in, almost anything you love, you can find yeah. something yeah. in the industry that, that kind of fulfills that. So you just brought up the, the reach nationally that you guys have, and you just spent some time in Washington doing some some pretty important stuff. Why don't you tell us about that and how that went? So um, that had to be like <laughs> pretty intense. Yeah, yeah, that was a, <laughs> yeah, that was a meeting I never thought that I'd be, uh, never thought I'd be tapped to be any expert witness for anything, um, short of maybe a crime. Especially for somebody who just stumbled into <laughs> this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it was quite an opportunity. Um, they reached out and it was a, a farm bill hearing in one of the Senate subcommittees, and I was able to come in and lend some rural water perspective to, to that. And yeah, it was, a, it was quite the meeting. I've, I've always said the two worst parts of the job have always been the politics and the paperwork. Mm -hmm. And so I guess eventually, if you, keep, if you work long enough, then that's, that's all you do is just the politics and the, <laughs> and the <laughs> and paperwork. The paperwork. Yeah. Uh, so no, it, it is important though, um, Folks need to be aware uh, that, that it's part of it. It's how it works. Um, you, you have to engage, you have to advocate. Uh, you never can stop because there's limited resources. Everybody's vying for the, for the same resources and you think it would be impossible for water or wastewater ever to fall out of mind of, with the critical nature of the resource. I mean, literally water is life. Yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, I, I was honored to be able to get up there and, and play a small part in, in bringing some information. But it is something that I would encourage everybody in the industry to, to keep in mind in any way that uh, anybody can advocate. That's one of the services that we try and provide. We want to be a voice. Um, not for rural water, but of rural water. So we want to make sure that we take, because I can go up there on the hill and I can talk and say uh, anything that that I want to, and it really ha holds no purchase unless they can follow up with I, rural water's membership, the water and wastewater systems locally, and have that sentiment reflected at the ground level. And so that's, you know, we're a grassroots organization. And Well, since and you're in that vein, won't you elaborate on that? like how you can help the rural water systems well, stay in that vein and to kind of allude to that a little bit. What, what Alabama rural water actually provides to the state of Alabama's rural water systems throughout? Oh, through our services? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're a, you know, a membership trade association, essentially for that supports all the water and wastewater entities' concerns, but our primary focus are our water and wastewater systems. They're the membership and they're the ones that, um, that we intend tend to serve. And by extension, we get to work with wonderful associate members and excellent companies and bring them in because that's also part of the service when systems call us and they have a need, regardless of whether it's um, a new regulation that they're struggling to comply with or understand, or if um, they have leaks that they need to find. You know, we got our, our, our group is boots on the ground technical assistance. So we're kind of a loose cadre of training experts and, and water and wastewater people who have done the job and uh, we're headquartered in Montgomery's, but our people are out in the in the state year round. Uh, so whether it's an emergency that happens or something that that a system's planning to do, 
Uh, it, it's kind of hard to say. You don't want to just say, we do everything. Uh, but literally, we will try and meet any need, current or perceived, uh, for any system, whether it be through direct contact and work or whether it be through connecting them with companies um, yeah. to provide services or whether it be go and advocate on behalf. Whatever is required is, is what we what we try to do. I love that. And that goes into kind of the next question I was going to ask. But first, I want to circle back to how you kind of got here, because it's a funny story. I always tell people it's like when I'm there's this there's this time where I was on top of a tank. I climbed down inside. I was trying to fix the vent or the um, float gauge. Next thing you know, I'm in a inflatable raft inside of a million gallon tank with a pole trying to do some work. And I just, it's one of those moments where I just stop and I look around and I'm like, how did I get here? <laughs> you know, you were talking about not, you weren't playing with stuff as a kid thinking, I'm yeah. going to be the rural water director. I think we all have a story like that. It's like, you never know really where you're going to land. And it's so funny. Also, um, you would be in a circuit rider and kind of being out and liking uh, what you were doing there, sharing the wealth and the knowledge. That's kind of what Jim and I do. Um, and I think that's what we were talking before we started here is, this podcast is kind of a good platform to do the same thing, mm -hmm. to share that wealth and the knowledge and, and problem solving skills. So that way you don't have to learn all these problems through doing it. You know, you can almost just do it through osmosis. Yeah. Um, it's it's kind of like having a, uh, a journeyman or something, you know, that you're an apprentice, but you've got all this knowledge and you can't absorb it if you don't know it's out there. So it's about community for sure. And we've interacted with you guys out in the field indirectly we've had clients that have had like a tank wash out and that tank is isolated and it's a new director and they have no idea what the system looks like and you know where we're going to get our water from you know can we keep pumping and just have pressure release valves or can we just bring in a, an additional tank and you know subsidize the demand for the system and i actually called one of your circuit riders and it's like hey i'm over here at this system what do you think what can we do because our expertise are from the ground up at that water tank. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we lean on our license operators and our circuit riders to kind of help with the ins and outs of what is before and after that tank. So, yeah, they, they actually helped out and saved the money as well. Yeah. yeah. That, that's why these partnerships are so valuable. Because yeah. um, a lot of these systems, they might not know, you know, that y'all offer those resources or that assistance. And they'll call us. And if it's something we can't handle, we call you. <laughs> you know? And then you figure I'm not quite sure about that answer, but I'll get back with y'all now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's why never be scared to say, I don't know, but mm -hmm. I can find Absolutely. out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've got a lot yeah. of friends. We'll, yeah. we'll uh, circle up and figure this out. Well, and that's something that's always been critical with us um, is protecting the bottom line for these utilities because there's typically only one revenue stream mm -hmm. and that's through selling the service. And um, we always want to look for protecting Aunt Nancy on Main Street. Mm -hmm. You know, she's the one that's, if they have to raise revenue, that's typically where it comes from. And uh, we want to make sure that they could save as many dollars and, and put that into the field as possible so um, they, they can keep their rates affordable to the extent. But it's also critical that they uh, fund their operations. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, it's, it's a delicate balance. And we just try and be one of those tools that let us come in and take a shot. Almost everything we do is um, we, we have a program that supports it so there's not a direct charge to the utilities. We do have some fee-based things. But we're a nonprofit. We're true nonprofit. We don't have shareholders that we have to impress. So we try to ensure that we'll cover costs and try and keep operating, and and that's it. We're we're not in the business to to make a fortune. We want to turn anything that might be a profit back into additional resource support for the for the industry. That's good because I, I think so many people have the idea of they just turn the faucet on, they have water. Oh, well, it was you know, you, you talked about, you know, you've got to provide the resource, but then what goes hand in hand with that is what we do is protecting the asset. Because if that's not protected and the infrastructure is not upgraded or replaced or, you know, whatever, it can be a, a really bad deal. <laughs> yeah, you can't do it all on your own. Yeah. You know? and, and the more we can get that message out there that we're here, we always tell people we want to be a resource for your tanks. Yeah. And that's how you guys are across the board. 
And to kind of bring us back around, that was something I was going to ask is like, we all know what rural water associations really do. And some of them kind of focus and specialize on certain things like maybe education or being out in the field. What would you say Alabama rural water really focuses on? Or do you try to kind of have the shotgun approach? Well, there are, <clears throat> there are a number of priorities. It's, it's hard to really address them all. It's a, our, our bread and butter and primary focus has got to be the, the boots on the ground technical assistance with, with so, well, two, twofold. So operator certification training, tra training and technical assistance. You can kind of boil it down to that. Uh, we do a number of other things. We're a micro lender. With USDA, we can make uh, you know low interest, short uh, short term, small loans for utilities. If yeah, uh, I didn't know that. Well, anybody that's looking right now or watching this right now, how how do they go about that? A little insert right here. Insert right <laughs> here. <laughs> uh, um, as with everything, call Jarena. No, <laughs> but that is that, that is also a, a standing option for anything. But no, just contact our office and let us know what you need, and we can look at it and see if it's a fit. Um, we typically have the capacity to uh, loan maybe one hundred and fifty thousand dollars once per year. Um, we we started out with a partnership with USDA. I say a partnership. We applied through a program, and we're given. Uh, I think it was about $600,000 in two rounds to start the thing. All that got loaned out and it revolves. And, it, and again, it's intended to be small, short term. So um, if you need a backhoe, listen, love our partners at SRF and USDA, but they don't want to fool with like one backhoe. They, they want to come in and, and give you the, yeah. the infrastructure, right? So. If you need like a backhoe or you need matching funds to access these larger um, dollars, then you can call us. But again, that, so that is one, that program's so small in the, in the network that most people aren't aware. I mean, it's on the website along with the other. Yes. Um, our primary focus, again, is the, is the technical assistance and training that's, that's in the communities. We want to work in the community. All the citizens are our neighbors to some extent, literally with some of our uh, employees were scattered across the state. So um, in every town I'm in, I see them as, you know, my, my fellow Alabamian mm -hmm. folks, because we all, we're all kind of struggling with some of the same stuff. We've acquired some new equipment. We, like we've got a ground penetrating radar. Uh, we've got some drone stuff that, that we're working into now. So, I, you know, for small systems, Really, you shouldn't spend thirty thousand dollars on ground penetrating radar. Probably not going to use it, and not going to need to maintain that equipment. That's dollars better spent elsewhere. So just borrow ours, and it comes with a trained operator too. So we'll borrow you know, your local circuit right. It may may be a little while. Uh, you know, it'd be quicker for you to just pull one out of the closet. But we'll get you on the schedule, and we can get over there, and it won't cost anything. And we're looking to expand those type of opportunities. Um, Workforce development is a big effort that, that we're undertaking right now. So through National Rural Water, we've actually formed an apprenticeship program that has been underway for a couple of years now and is starting to pick up. And uh, we're also trying to coordinate with other local state groups. So we've got like Alabama Training Network, or, or I'm sorry, ATN, Alabama Technology Network and um, the community college system, a variety. Skills for Success is, a, is another group that's working on some course creation. Of course, we partner with ADM and the certification um, group because we want to make sure that the training we're putting in the field is what the regulators need to see happen so we can continue to make sure everybody's moving in the, in the coordinated direction. Uh, and there's just a ton of opportunity with that. So we're, we're trying new things. We're trying to figure out new curriculum, new ways to put this training together and hopefully support because community college uh, and other universities, you know, we just partnered with uh, or uh, got a MOU with Faulkner University in the state where if you're a member of Alabama Rural Water and uh, we've got, they're actually coming and talking and Friday at this event. But if you're a member of Rural Water, Alabama Rural Water, then your employees get half off to it, online tuition through Faulkner. Um, and it's not all programs, but it's a good subset of them. 
or the employee's family gets half off tuition. And if the kids go on uh, the Montgomery campus, I think it's not half off tuition, it's a $10,000 scholarship and they can train you know, more the on-site, not the online version of the deal. Um, and then Tommy Bone, my partner over there, who, who showed up one day when I was coming back from lunch and all this kind of just came, came out of nowhere, it was, it was wonderful. He came back and he said, in addition to the family, you could just pick two people that you know. And so you, you, do, you have an errant, do you have an errant niece or nephew that you're trying to get back on or you know, a, a cousin or something? You can offer this extension and it's all through the network and the partnership yeah. of, of you know, the, the power of membership, yeah. really. That's awesome. That's great stuff to get out there too, yeah. you know? Like yeah. get, just get the message out there and that stuff's available. You know, mm -hmm. yeah, and it, so skills for success. You know, they started a program with CDLs um, and some heavy equipment training. Doesn't cost the utility anything, and the employees can go become get get their CDL in a short amount of time and not have to pay the expenses. So we're working. We're hoping to plug in some of those resources and put some of our expertise and get that together and try and offer. Um, just as much as possible to, to build it out and have a structured, you know, quality program for people to take advantage of and get into, we want to promote the industry as well. And, you know, don't move a hundred miles away from home unless you, you know, you're running. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then the industry as a whole, kind of like we do is it was, we're proactive instead of reactive. Yeah. I mean, you're able to not try to find people that are coming to you. That'd be something Mike Rowe would get behind, you know, that whole workforce <laughs> yeah. thing. That brings me right into this one that I think this is one question uh, when we were talking to some of our peers and stuff that everybody, it's it's so funny. They, they said, uh, I got this across the board. You know, what are the three biggest challenges that rural water faces right now? Uh, the three biggest? <laughs> and maybe not even just rural water, but in general, the industry, you know, because the, the industry problems are our problems. Yeah, I you know, I don't know. A few years ago, the first one probably would have been lack of resources or lack of money. Mm -hmm. And then the, you get the infrastructure laws passed and there's this huge influx of resources that come in. And now your problem is there's not enough service providers. So you got money to pay them and nobody to pay. Yep. <laughs> yep. So it's kind of like this, these, uh, these problems come and go. The regulatory burden is, is always a tough one. Um, I, regulations are, are needed to some extent. It, it helps everybody stay on the same page and we're all of the mind that we want to have safe um, drinking water. We want to protect these things. Um, we don't want issues like what happened in Flint, um, for example, you know, with the lead and copper stuff. So it's good, it's good to have account, forced accountability that, that folks can follow. I know that's on a lot of people's mind right now is the lead and copper lead and situation. Copper. <clears throat> yeah, inventory and replacement and where do you stop? Do you stop it before the meter or after the meter? Yeah. It seems to me um, there's always going to be regulatory change. Uh, most recently, it's hard for general managers to kind of be able to grab these regulations. They're not quite as black and white as they used to be where you would issue something and you got a timeline and you got specifically what you need to do. Some of this stuff gets into some gray area that's that's kind of uh, confusing and that's one of the things when I have opportunity to go meet with um, uh, I'll have meetings from periodically with like EPA region 4 and which is our region and then when we go up to DC or attend these national meetings we'll have the the national folks are there and I like to sit down with them and, and kind of express some of these concerns because it is difficult things that work uh, outside of Alabama don't necessarily always translate to Alabama. So with lead and copper, it's kind of like the private property type issue. Um, yeah. And my comment with them on that is there's two types of lead poisoning in Alabama. <laughs> what? One of them's much more acute and deadly right. and, and quicker onset yeah. and delivered through like a 44. Uh -huh. or, you know, yeah. And uh, involves uh, trespassing on private property mm -hmm. is a, is a mm -hmm. quick way to get a dose of uh, so. Kind of communicating those those differences, you could see like up in the northeast, the meters are in the basements of the buildings because of the frost and that. So the legal 
you know, there, there's a, a the distinct, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, there's a, it's a lot easier for somebody to access that property because in order to have the service, you had to go all the way into the structure anyway. So it makes sense that the water system would have control. But um, no, in Alabama, it's literally the curb stops at the curb and everything beyond is, in general, is owned by that. And I just, again, I don't want anybody to suffer any lead poisoning, of course. Uh, nobody's in favor of lead. I'd love to get rid of all of it. But at the same time, um, it's kind of important that folks have control over, I'd hate to get to the point where we have to start creating ordinances where you can't connect to the water system anymore unless you've got button. Well, even, even once you get to that meter and you dig it up and you realize, uh, well, we don't know, you mark it unknown, it's lead. That's the way it's correct. It's, it's, it's documented as lead. But if you can get to it and expose it and it's probably something else other than lead, PVC or whatever, then you can pretty much say, okay, we're, we're lead free here. Yeah, well... I'm yeah, I've always had some difficulty with the lead rule, even the, the older original one. Um, and it had to do with the water system being penalized for what's going on inside the residence. Um, you test, you know, the, you have to rely on a customer to pull that mm -hmm. sample and you train them and they'll do that. And if it comes back and it's got lead, then if there's enough of that, then me as the water system is the one who's going to catch a violation and have to pay a fine. I can educate the customer, but I can't force them to replumb their mm -hmm. homes and things. So right. some of that, I'm, you know, so regulations are difficult. It's a it's a give and take. You want to protect people. You want to try and help. <clears throat> uh, you yeah. want to try and avoid crossing any of those lines. Right. And I think there'll always be kind of that that struggle, which again is why everybody should stay engaged and mm -hmm. everybody's voice should should be at the table. We certainly need advocates that are fighting to get rid of every bit of lead, even if it involves moving in and pulling everything out of homes and, and having some fund to, to rehabilitate that. And at the same time, we need the, you know, all, all visions need to be represented and then hash it out and hopefully we'll have the best final. Yeah. yeah. There's a middle ground somewhere. And somewhere. transparency is key, you know, and, and that's another thing we always advocate, transparency, you know, that's a big, you just, Tell people, you know, they might be thinking something else. Oh, they're coming on here to do all this. And meanwhile, there's you're trying to help. You know, it's simple. So yeah. life's about balance, you know. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, but, yeah, I think that will wrap it up. We appreciate you coming on with us. Yeah. Thank uh, you so yeah. much. It's been great. Always a pleasure. Yeah. 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 This, this wraps it up with Mr. Rob White with Alabama Rural Water. A lot of information here. In the meantime, before you see us again, don't forget, cover your assets.